The Kohen Gadol had eight special clothing garments. The regular Kohen had four. And according to the Gemara, these garments atoned for various sins. We have the ketones, which was a long shirt. The Gemara says that atoned for the sin of murder, because we see that that type of garment was associated with murder in the case of Yosef, when they dipped the ketones, that shirt in blood. The um, pants, which both the regular Kohen and the Kohen Gadol wore, atoned for adultery because that's the uh, covers up the private part. The turban atoned for haughtiness. It's on the top of the head. The belt atones for improper thoughts because that is the separation point between the upper and lower parts of the human body. The lower parts indicating the primal urges of a person. The breastplate, which had the stones, the gemstones that the Kongodal wore on his chest that would light up when he had questions. Excuse me, that atoned for mistakes in judgment because the heart is like the seat of understanding. The aphod, which was the backwards apron, that had stones attached to it and on the Kohen Gadol's shoulders, that atoned for the sin of idol worship because that's the sort of thing that priests would wear, both good ones and Lahavdil, the idolatrous ones, the pagan ones. The coat, the me'il, would atone for the sin of Lashon Hara, gossip, because it had bells that made noise corresponding to the noise of the uh, gossip. And that sits the golden band wore, worn on the forehead atoned for chutzpah, because the forehead in general is associated with, um, with chutzpah. Like, uh, you know, there's a verse about that. The forehead of a brazen woman. Okay, so... Today's year, we're going to focus specifically on the two stones that were on the Kohen Gadol's shoulders. Now, these stones are a little bit overlooked, if I can say so myself. Who am I to say they're overlooked? Maybe they're not overlooked. Maybe everybody pays attention to them. But when I was in school and I was in yeshiva, they just, they never really spoke about those two stones. The main focus was always on the 12 stones that are on the Kohen Gadol's heart, which had the names of the tribes inscribed on them, which there was a special divine name placed in between the folds of that garment called the Uri and the Tumen. And when that divine name was there in the time of the first temple, it would light up when the Kohen Gadol had a question. Those are kind of the famous gemstones of the Kohen Gadol. But he also had two Shoham stones, whatever Shoham means, that were on his shoulder. And the Shoham stones were kind of the connection between the aphod and the Choshen. So the aphod is a backwards apron. It was worn on his back, and it had straps in front of him that he would tie to hold it in place. And the chosha mishpah was worn on his chest. But what held it in place? So there were uh, straps that came up from the top of the apron that was on his back, went all the way up till his shoulders, just over the shoulders, attached to those straps were two shoham stones inlaid in gold. And then attached to that inlay of gold was two golden ropes. 
which held onto the Choshen Mishpat from the top to hold it onto his heart. And on the bottom of the Choshen Mishpat, in order that it not sway when he turned or bent forward, there were uh, straps of blue wool that connected it to the bottom of those shoulder straps behind him. So that's how the Choshen Mishpat stayed in place. Now, these two Shoham stones also had the names of the Jewish people engraved on them. However, there were only two stones, not one per tribe, as it was in the Choshen Mishpat, a total of two, which is why there were six on one stone and six on the other stone. And in today's lesson, we're going to learn which six were on one and which six were on the other. Even though you might say that it's obvious which six were on one and which six were on the other, because after all, it says, kiss soldo some, that it was in the order of their birth. But as we're going to see, it's not so simple. Okay, here we go. Chapter 28, verse 9. Then take two Shoham stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of the names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. So, if I were to ask you, what is the order of the 12 tribes on these two stones? What would you say? Without peeking ahead and looking at Rashi. What would you say? Which six were on the first stone? The first six weren't. The first six who were born. Okay, good. Which are those? What are their names? Dig deep into your knowledge of Jewish history and the book of Genesis. Yehuda, Ah, that's what I thought you would say. But actually, Sachar and Zulun were born after Gad, Asher, and Dan, and Naphtali. Because if you remember the story, Leah had four children, and then she stopped having children. Rachel was jealous. She said to her husband, you know, I'm angry. Why has Hashem not given me children? Yaakov said, why are you angry at me? It's not about me. It's your problem, basically. I have children. You don't. Anyway, they had this whole back and forth. And the end of it was that Rachel gave him her maidservant as a wife. None other than Bilha. And Bilha had two children, Don and Naphtali. Leah said, hey, seems like a good idea, especially since I'm not having children right now. Let me try with my midwife. And she gave Yaakov Zilpa, and Zilpa had got an usher. And then Leah had two more children, Yesachar and Zebulun. That was after the whole story with the flowers that Reuven brought to his mother and Rachel asked for them and Leah said, it's bad enough you took my husband, now you want my flowers. So Leah said, okay, you can have my, I'll let you have the flowers, but I get Yaakov tonight. And that night um, she conceived Yisachar and then Zavulun. And then finally, Rachel had her own two children, first Yosef, and then a few years later, Benjamin. 
So the order of birth would seem to be exactly what Rashi says it was. Let's read Rashi. Kisoldo sum, Kiseder Shinoldu, in the order in which they were born. Reuven, Shimon, Levi Yehuda. Then, even though those are not all the sons of Leah, but in the order of the birth, Don Naphtali. Those were born next. Al Ha'achas, that's on the one stone. Val Hashnia, and on the second stone, God Usher, those were the two of Zilpa. Yisachar Zulun, going back to Leah's last two, but that's the order they were born in. And finally, Yosef and Benjamin. Okay, but Rashi's not done yet. Mole, Rashi says. Benjamin was written with two yuds. When we talk about the spelling of certain words in the Hebrew language, we can use the expression chaser or mole. Chaser indicates that a letter is missing. It's vocalized, but it's not written. And mole means that the letter is not missing, that it's a vowel that could have been skipped, but it is spelled out. So binyamin, the second year does not have to be there because you could just vocalize the E sound, which is what the Nakuda of Patach means. And even if you don't put the Yud in there, we know that it's supposed to be Binyamin. So nevertheless, it was spelled in the Aphoid Mole, full. Meaning you say it didn't have that Yud missing. It was present. Shekenu kasal b'makam tuldasai, because that's how it's written when he was born. In the Chumash, Binyamin is usually written with only one yud, only the first yud. But when he was born, it says two yuds. And that is what Rashi seems to be saying. Another meaning of Kitol Doisam, the way they were born. Meaning to say, not about the order of the birth, but the spelling of the names, the, the way the name was spelled at the time of their birth. So Binyamin's name at the time of birth was with two yuds. That's how it was on the Shoham stones. Shekin who costed the Makam told us that's how it's written at the point of his birth. Chaf hei oisius b'chol achas v'achas. 25 letters on each stone. Count the letters of Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Don, Naphtali. You'll get the 25. Count Garash, Yisach, Azul, and Yosef, Binyamin. With two yuds, you'll also get the 25. Okay, that's a very nice Rashi. Spelling things out for us in case we forgot the order of the birth of the tribes. But it's really not Rashi style. Rashi if he says something, it's because he's teaching us something. When, when something is obvious, Rashi doesn't say it. He, he lets us understand it on our own. Now, if the verse says, kisoldosum, it's the way they were born. Well, if you want to know how they were born, turn back a few pages to Parshas Vayetze, and you'll see exactly how they were born. It's, of course, the same order that Rashi says, but why does he have to tell us that? Excuse me, that's the first question. The second question is, why is it important for us to know that Binyamin was spelled with two yuds? Why is that important? And if you say, well, that's because Rashi is interpreting the word kitoldosum to mean that, it's the birth spelling. But that itself is questionable because Rashi says that kitoldosum means to tell you the order of the names. The order is the way they were born. So why is Rashi doubling up on the meaning of kitoldosum and saying that it means two things? First of all, the way they were born, the order in which they were born. And second of all, 
the birth names the way it's spelled at the time of birth. How does Rashi know you can learn both of these things from the same word? And finally, to top it all off, the very end of Rashi also seems out of place. 25 letters in each and every stone. Why is that important? I mean, it's cute. It's cute to know that there's 25 in each stone. That's great. But that's not Rashi's style. There is a commentary called the Baal HaTurim. And the Baal HaTurim is very into numbers of letters, numbers of words, gematrias, all that sort of thing. I don't want to call it trivia because it's not trivial. But, I mean, nothing in Torah is trivial, but, but it's not the simple, straightforward interpretation of the text. It's small, little, hidden things that you could kind of learn out from different, like, side points. It's almost a side point. The number of letters is like, okay, whatever. It's nice to know. But why is it important on the level of Pshat? Rashi is telling us the meaning of the Pasuk. Why is it important for the meaning of the Pasuk to know that there was 25 on each side? So basically, the Rebbe is asking that this entire Rashi, from beginning to end, really we don't understand what it's doing here. The Rashi could say nothing, and, and the Pasuk would be understood just fine. Write them in order, finished. In Yemen with two years? Who, who said why, why is, who said it has to be two years on a basic level of understanding? 25 letters? Why is that important? What are we learning from this? Okay, so I want to tell you that even though it seems so obvious as to the order of the tribes on the stones, because the Pasuk says, Kisoldosam, the order in which they were born, actually it's not simple at all. This is classic rabbinic interpretation, where you can take something that seems so straightforward, so obvious, and you could say, nah, maybe not. Maybe it means something else. I'm going to examine it from a different angle, and I'll give you a different interpretation. So there's about another four interpretations as to the order of these names. And um, I'm just going to give you three of them. I don't remember the fourth one clearly. But one of them says, only the second stone was an order of birth. The first stone was not an order of birth. Where do they get that from? They actually get it from Yes, Anna, you were saying something? You suddenly disappear in your voice. Okay, yes, that's my fine. My voice disappeared because I got a call and I'm on my oh, phone okay. and the call interrupted. I'm not oh. sure how Zoom not to interrupt me with calls during this meeting. There must be some setting that I could do that with. Have a figure. No, out. no, I, I don't think you can. I tried okay. before. I had the same well, problem. Should, Thank you. They should come Sorry. up with something. The smart people in the world should come up with something. So, here is the text that clues us into this to this opinion, and it's quite. Interesting how how the verse can be interpreted this way. Shisha, Misha, Moisam, Allah, Eben, Echas. Six names on one. Kama. Six names. It doesn't say the order. Just six names. Vesimosa, Shisha, Hamei, Sarim. The names of the other six. Allah, Eben, Ashenis. On the second stone. Kisol, Daisam. That's in order of birth. There's a very important comma here. The 
uh, the Torah has trup on it. Trup means the the um, words. Cantillation. Sorry, the, the tune. The cantillation, exactly. The tune of the Torah. And almost every Pasuk has what we call an asnachta. And an asnachta is like a pause in the middle of the verse. It's like a comma, but not just a small comma, like a major comma. And, and that kind of breaks up the verse into two parts. And the way to read it is six names on one stone and the six remaining names on the second stone, those were in order of birth. Here's how I would read it if I was reading from the Torah. Shisha mishemosam ala eveno echas veshemos hashisha hanosarim ala elen hashim is kisoladosam so there's a pause by Allah Evan Ho'echos. Allah Evan Ho'echos. That's a pause. So six on one stone, not in order. I mean, obviously there's an order, but not the order of birth necessarily. The six remaining names on the second stone, those were in order of birth. In fact, this is one of the opinions in the Gemara Sota. 36a that says on the first stone Yehuda came first because Yehuda was more important than Reuven and Shimon and Levi he was the you know his tribe was the source of the kingship among the Jewish people and only the second stone was an order of birth and the Gemara actually quotes the verse and says, Only on the second stone was it in order of birth, but not on the first stone. Okay, so that's, that's an opinion that's totally different than Rashi's. Then we have another opinion that is completely in a different order. You would have never picked this order ever. The opinion of the other opinion of the Talmud is that the six, um, that the six, sorry, that the order of the names had nothing to do with the order in which they were born, nothing at all to do with that. In fact, they place Binyamin on the top of the second stone and Yosef on the bottom of the second stone, completely reversing them. Because they interpret kisaldosam not about the order in which they were born, but rather the spelling given when they were born. Just like we mentioned, binyamin can be spelled in different ways, and the other the names of the other tribes are sometimes mentioned in different ways. Instead of Ruven, it's Ho Ruveni, or instead of Dun, it's the Dunni and so on, different ways that the Tanakh mentions the tribes. Kisol Dosam is talking about the spelling. The spelling is the order, uh, sorry, not the order, the spelling is the way the names were spelled at birth. Okay, that's opinion number two that's different than Rashi, but completely different. Then we have the Rambam, who Mamish mixes things up, totally mixes things up. According to the Rambam, the order was as follows. And I'm going to say the order, and I'm going to see if any of you can figure out what this order is based on. It might seem off the wall, but if you ever listen to the quiz shows, you know how they have these quiz shows on the TV or the radio? We have to figure it out. I don't know what they're called, but let's see if you can figure it out. Okay, you ready? The Rambam says the order on the first stone was Ruvain, Levi, Yisachar, Naphtali, God, and Yosef. And the order on the second stone 
was Shimon, Yehuda, Zevulun, Dan, Asher, and Binyamin. Isn't it, isn't it every other one? Oh, exactly. <laughs> you got it. It's every other one. So how does it make sense that it's an order if it's every other one? You, you don't want you don't want to have either one of the stones to be primary. So you go, you know, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Exactly. You're reading across instead of down. You have to know how to read it. Ruvain is first. Shimon is second, but he's not second under Ruvain. He's second on the top of the second stone. Levi is third, second in the first stone, but third after Shimon, who is the top of the second stone. Yehuda is fourth, second on the second stone, but fourth after Levi, who is on the first stone. Back and forth, back and forth. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, or, well, um, yeah, Yisachar, Zavulon. So he, he actually has two differences. Uh, to Rashi. First of all, he goes back and forth between the stones, A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. And second of all, he also says that they're grouped according to their mothers. Meaning to say we do it in the order they were born, but also in the order of mothers. So we keep them in a group. The, Leah had her babies first. All her babies are first. Bilha had babies next, her, her kids are next. Zilpa was next, her kids are next. And Rachel was last, her kids are last. So that's another uh, difference in the translation of Ketel Dosan. It's in the order of the mothers who gave birth. Not in the order of the individual births, but in the order of the mothers who gave birth. And he also says that instead of doing it down, he does it across. Okay. So now we know very well why Rashi has to say Ruvain, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Dan, Naftali on one because there's so many different opinions it's not clear in the text what it means. And Rashi says yes, Kisol Dosam is referring to both. The one and the two are both kasoldosum. After all, the verse says the one and the two. That means that they're similar. And the kasoldosum is going on both of them. And therefore, the first one is also an order. And the second one is also an order. However, one can ask, why is the verse why is the word Ketaldosam positioned in such a way that it seems to be referring only to the second stone? Six on the one stone. And six on the other stone, Ketaldosam, like we said. The punctuation can make it seem like the opinion of the Gemara that the first stone was not in the order at all. Like the famous joke of the guy who got the uh, parking ticket. I don't want to bore you if I if you heard the joke or if did I tell it last week? I don't remember. He got a parking ticket and and he said to the police officer, "I don't understand what I did wrong." And the police officer points to the sign. It says "private parking." So it says "private par property, no parking allowed." He says, "Officer, that's not how I read it." Private parking? Sorry, private property? No, parking allowed. That was a joke that we used to say in Yeshiva. So it's all about the punctuation. So the punctuation seems to indicate that only the second stone was in order. So Rashi has to address that. And that's why Rashi says that Kesoldosam has... Two meanings. 
the fact that it's written after the second verse, after the second stone, excuse me, is because the second meaning is referring specifically to the second stone. The second meaning is, excuse me, that it was also written, spelled the way the names were spelled at the time of birth. And that is specifically about the second stone. Because the second stone has the name Binyamin, and Binyamin is a name that is sometimes spelled with one yud or with two yuds. And by putting Kesel Dosen by the second stone, the verse is inf informing you that in terms of the second stone, there is another meaning of Kesel Dosen, which is to spell it the way it's spelled when he was born. And to call me. I guess he doesn't know that I give a class at this time. I got to tell him my schedule. Anyway, the point is that in order to emphasize that the two stones were equal, and you shouldn't think that the second stone um, was different than the first stone, like the Gemara actually says one opinion that they were different, and that only the second stone was in order, and maybe according to that opinion, the first stone contained the important tribes, and the second stone only included the less important tribes, which is why they're called Hanosorim. The the six leftover tribes, like like really not important ones. Those were in order. And the first ones were the important ones, and they were in the order of importance and so on. So Rashi wants to negate that opinion. And that's why Rashi says, not only was it in the order of birth, but there was 25 letters on each stone indicating equality, that all of them are equal in the eyes of Hashem. Okay, so this is to explain the necessity of Rashi to write what he writes. But now we're going to try to understand what's the lesson that we can learn from this in terms of our service of Hashem. After all, we don't have a Beis HaMikdash. We don't have a Kohen Gadol. We don't have any of these garments today. So really, when we read these things, besides learning about the history and learning about the mitzvah, and knowing what we're going to do when Mashiach comes, maybe speedily in our days, we also want to learn something that, that we can take a lesson from and can teach us something in our daily lives in terms of our relationships with Hashem, our relationships with other Jewish people, and so on and so forth. And that's what we'll address now. But first, if there's any questions, now's the time. I mean, it's always the time. But if you have any questions, please. Question. Or comments. Yes. Would you then say that uh, Ebena Shanit and uh, it are extra words? Let me see what was the other one that I had. The fact that it says... Uh, Yeah, and and the et shemot are, are also extra words. What do you mean? Well, the fact that it says, you know, six six names on the first stone, you don't need to say et shemot. You say the uh, shisha hanotarim. You know. Uh, that's that's understood. I mean, this, what else are you going to put on there? And so, therefore, why say Al Ibn Ashanit? Because it tells you in the in the pasuk before Ashte uh, Abne So, if on the first one you put the first six, then what's the second one for? Unless it's for the last for the last six names. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
I mean, you could understand it, but it would be unusual for the Pasuk to to leave that out. It's like it's like you're leaving the Pasuk would be leaving us hanging if it would say six stones on one. That's it? And we shouldn't say anything after that? I mean, of course, if there's six on one and there's twelve on both, obviously there's six on the others, but it's like it's like a half okay. sentence. It's like without the word shemot, you mean? Without the uh, without the word evan, or without the uh, without the word shemot, those two words probably are. The are... word shemot, according to Rashi's interpretation, is necessary because the ketoldotam is referring to the spelling of the name. That the name is spelled the way they were, the way he was born. Benjamin was born, and his name was spelled uh, with two yuds. So the Shemot are Ketoldotam. The names are the way they were given when they were born. So that's as far as Shemot. Why does it have to say I, I, I never said Ketoldotam is, is extra. What I'm saying is the second word, the second Shemot that's in the Pasuk I'm is explaining. not necessary because you no, can say Ved Shisha Hanotarim Ala Shemit Ketoldotam. So I'm explaining the word Shemot is necessary because Ketoldotam is referring to Shemot. It's not just referring to the Shisha, to the six, that they are in order of birth, but Rashi says it's also referring to the spelling of the names. Shemot, Ketoldotam. The names are the way they were spelled at birth. So it has to have the word Shemot. So you do. You had the word... first. You had the first time. No, but it's not referring to the first time. There's only a doubt about the spelling in the second stone. In the first six, there's no doubt. There's only one spelling of Ruvain, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, and God and Asher. It's in the second where you have Binyamin that is sometimes spelled with a yud or without a yud. That's where it has to say. Ketoldo, Shemot Ketoldotam. These names, specifically Benjamin's name, is spelled the way it's spelled at his birth. So, I mean, the Gemara mentions that. The Gemara actually says one opinion that it's only referring to the spelling at birth and not to the order. Rashi says it's both, but but the word Shemot is important so that you know that it's referring to the spelling of the name. Okay. Do we have any idea what material the stones were made and how the names were? Was it engraved or it, was it painted over? And there are so many other symbols. Why exactly the names of, of the first, you know, the, the children? <laughs> I'm sorry, too many questions at once. Well, the Avni Shoham, um, it seems, was a certain type of precious stone. Exactly what the name of that precious stone is? Well, the translation that I'm looking at here on Safaria says Lazuli stones. I actually have no idea what Lazuli stones are, to be honest. Excuse me, let me see if there's any other. Oh, some say onyx stones. Oh, okay. Okay. That's why I would assume because onyx is usually black. It was engraved or it was painted? It, it was engraved. It was engraved. It was engraved. Upitahta okay. means you should engrave. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, oh, I'm seeing either lazuli or onyx, but I don't really know what lazuli is, so I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Rabbi, hang on one second. Let me just answer the other question. In terms of why it says uh, the names of the Bnei Yisrael and nothing else, is because the whole point of these garments is to atone for the Jewish people. So by having the names of the tribes, it's uh, it's it's going to atone for all of the members of the Jewish people. Okay. 
Okay, I understand. Thank you. Sure. Question, somebody else had a question? I just put okay. in the uh, chat a picture of lapis lazuli. Oh, okay. Oh, that's wonderful. Rabbi? Yes, I'm looking at the chat. Oh, I see it. Very nice. Okay, yes, go ahead. The um, the plates that the Hag Hagadol wore um, with the stones, why did they have different colors and why, uh, how were they related to the tribes themselves? You know? uh, that's definitely a subject worth investigating. And it probably deserves its own shear, but I did not uh, prepare for that shear. So, <laughs> so I'll have to leave it. But, but definitely there's some meaning behind each stone, how it relates to each tribe the color of the stone, and so on and so forth. But I, I don't know offhand. So the um, lesson, the lesson to be learned. When we speak it's about, you can unmute you all, you can unmute yourself as needed. When we speak about um, getting atonement, by the, uh, by the clothing of the Kohen Godol. So obviously, we should be doing something to deserve and earn that atonement. Right? Just like Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur comes, Hashem forgives. Yeah, that's true. But the more you prepare yourself for Yom Kippur, you do that by getting ready, the month of Elul, 10 days of repentance, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur itself. So then Yom Kippur is much more effective, impactful, meaningful, and so on. So the atonement of the Kohen Gadol that the Kohen Gadol accomplishes for the sake of the Jewish people is especially true when we are united, when we are unified, when we feel for each other, when we care for each other, when we recognize that even though we are 12 separate tribes, and each tribe had their own way of thinking, way of behaving, they had different dialects, by the way. We read in the book of, of Judges how there was once a civil war, and, and they could tell who was from the tribe of Ephraim by the way he pronounced the shin. They didn't used to know how to say shin. They would say they would say the S sound instead of the SH sound. And that's how they would know they were from the tribe of Ephraim, and then they would kill them, unfortunately, <laughs> in that story, when they had the civil war going on. But but in fact, it should not be that way. It should be that we honor and respect each other despite our differences and feel um, connected and united to each other and like one people despite our differences. And, um, you know, if we can say the horrific events of October 7th, you know, did accomplish a little bit of unity among the Jewish people. There was really terrible disunity in Israel, especially before the war, with all the protests and trying to bring down the government and all of that. And the war brought about a sense of unity, just knowing that really it's the Rabbi, whole world is against us. And if Rabbi, we don't at least have each other, then God forbid we're, we're actually finished. And, and the attitude in Israel especially, but to, to an extent also in the United States, has been very much of togetherness and, and recognizing the importance of every Jew, same, different, looks different, talks different, we're all one. And this is the lesson of these stones that the order is the order of birth. You can argue with age. 
if they would put the order in the order of importance, that's really the opposite of unity. Because you're saying, hey, <laughs> I'm Yehuda. I'm number one. I'm Levi. The Kohanim come for me. I should be up there in the top. Ruvain is, you know, the oldest, the Bahar. I should be first. Yosef, hey, what do you mean? Yosef, I saved all of you guys. Maybe Yosef should be first. It's never ending. That's disunity. When it comes to birth, you can't argue with age. So that is a nicer way. I'm putting you all on mute. Unmute yourselves as needed. That is a nicer way to write it in a way that is more unifying. And another point is that we're putting them together on these stones, different than the way it is in the breastplate, where each of them have their own stone and their own color, emphasizing the differences between them. They still are joined. They're sewn onto one backing, right? There was a, like a cloth backing, and then there was a golden setting, and then the stones were inlaid in the gold. Excuse me, so they're all connected through that, but nevertheless, each one had its own stone. So that's kind of reflecting how each tribe had its own unique path in serving Hashem, and that they each get their own atonement but that they're also part of the Jewish people, of course. But here, in the stones that were on the shoulders, the emphasis was more on the unity and less on the differences. Now, the number 25, which Rashi says is the same in both stones, is a very significant number. Because if you count the letters of Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, you'll realize that that's 25. And really that has to do with what we're talking about. Because the greatest unity amongst the Jewish people is when you have Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. When we're all unified recognizing Hashem is our king, Hashem is our father, we are created in order to serve him, that acts as the ultimate unifier of the Jewish people. So that's why the number 25 is significant. Now there is another phrase that also has 25. And that is the phrase that we say after Shema. Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuso Leolam Vaed. That also has 25 letters. I believe it's Imha Kolo, meaning to say it really has 24, but when you count the sentence itself as one, you get to 25. So, this represents a different level of unity. Baruch Shem and Shema represents a different level of unity. And now we're going to get a little bit into Hasidic philosophy. There's something called Yehuda Ilo'a and something called Yehuda Tata'a. Yehuda Ilo'a means a higher level unification, and Yehuda Tata'a means a lower level unification. Yehuda Ilah is the perspective that Hashem is everything. There's nothing outside of Hashem. You see um, the sun, you see Hashem. You see a flower, you see Hashem. You, you, there's nothing outside of Hashem. Hashem is everything. Hashem is everywhere. Hashem Echad. Hashem is one of the seven heavens and in the earth, all four directions. Hashem is the only one. That's Yehuda Ilah. That is looking at everything from the lens of on top, seeing everything from Hashem's perspective. There's nothing outside of Hashem. Everything you see, it's all part of Hashem. 
Then there's Yehuda Tata. Yehuda Tata is a lower lower level unification, and that's expressed in the verse Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuso Laolam Ba'ed. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And this is the perspective of finding Hashem within this world. It's not that we just see everything and say, well, Hashem is everywhere, Hashem is everything, there's nothing outside of Hashem, it just appears to be physical, but really it's spiritual. It's, it's something else. It's seeing Hashem within the details of this world. It's looking at the subatomic structure and saying, wow, this cannot be an accident. This is so complex for the subatomic structure to create an atom, for an atom to form into a molecule, for molecules to form together into a cell, for cells to form together into a living organism. This is unbelievable. This is because there is a divine master that created this and makes it all happen. And the same thing when looking at the larger aspects of this world, seeing each ecosystem, seeing how everything is just in the perfect balance, seeing the whole Earth's atmosphere, seeing how that's just in the perfect balance, seeing the solar system, seeing the galaxy, and all the galaxies and all the amazing things that are happening and the interrelationships between everything in space and the black holes and, and the antimatter, all these new things they're, they're, they're discovering, you see all the amazing complexity of the creation and you see Hashem from within the world. That's Yichud Tata. That's a unification from below, coming to the unification of Hashem from the perspective of below, from the perspective of this world. And that's the concept of Baruch Shem Kavay Machosel Lailam Ba'ed. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elekeinu Hashem Achad is what the tribe said to Yaakov. When Yaakov wasn't sure if they're all righteous or not, because the Shechina departed when he wanted to tell them when Mashiach was, was going to come. They said to him, hey, Shema Yisrael, listen, our father Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hashem is one. They were talking to him. They were telling him his perspective. The perspective of Yaakov from above, Hashem Echad, Hashem is only one. When he heard that, he responded and he said, Baruch Shem, Kavod Malchusol, Olam Ve'ed. I'm so happy to hear this. Blessed be Hashem's glorious kingdom forever and ever. He was talking to the Shvatim. He was giving it to them from their perspective. The Shvatim were not on the level of Yaakov. They didn't have those glasses to see the whole world from Hashem's perspective, like there's nothing outside of Hashem. They were on the lower level. They saw the world from their perspective. But at the same time, they found godliness within the world. So how does this tie into what we're learning? So Rashi has it in the order of birth from... Uh, uh, Ruvain till Benjamin. The order of birth comes from the father. The father represents Hashem. And that's the perspective that everything is one. There's no differences whatsoever. And that is true on, on that level. But then there's the second perspective which is that of the Rambam, if you recall, the Rambam says all six from one mother went first, even though he goes back and forth. And then the next mother, then the next mother, then the next mother. The mother represents the differences between them because that's where the babies become different. The way the father conceives them, obviously they're all the same. The way the mother develops them, they each develop into a different, unique child. So that's emphasizing the differences between them. And that's why, according to the Rambam, you had Ruvain on one side. Shimon, hey, he's different. He's, he's on the left side. Levi is the right kind of guy. Yehuda is a left kind of guy. They're each different. Yet at the same time, they are one. Because in order to read it right, you have to put the two side by side, at least in your mind, and read it from right to left like one stone. So that means even on the level of differences, 
where you're emphasizing the differences, you're still saying, no, I see the unity amongst the Jewish people despite the differences. I'm not ignoring the differences. I'm not just saying, hey, we're all Jewish, we're all from Hashem, it's all the same. No, I'm appreciating the differences. I see the Sephardim, the Ashkenazim, the Hasidim, the Zionists, the anti-Zionists. Okay, it's hard to deal with anti-Zionists, but whatever. <laughs> I see them all as an integral part of the Jewish people in some way. Hold on one second. The parking lot is full. I have to tell my wife. Give me one second, please. Okay, so uh, just to tie it all together, because I know David is going to ask, we have the... What was um, the connection What was the connection between all of this and Shema? Shema is Yehuda Elah. That's the higher level unity, where Hashem Echad, Hashem is one. You see everything from the perspective of Hashem. There's nothing outside of Hashem. That's like the Shvatim, the way they are from the Father. Like, we're all from the same Father. We're all equal without addressing the differences. Baruch Shem is seeing things from the perspective of Kivod Malchuso Olam Vod, seeing the glory of Hashem's kingdom from the kingdom. And that's like the tribes, the way they are on different sides, different mothers developed by those mothers into different human beings with different perspectives, but at the same time putting them onto these two stones that are read as one stone and saying, even though there's two, we're really one. Within the differences, we find unity. We find uniqueness in each person, and we are all completed by that uniqueness. Okay, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. Rabbi. Yes. I got, I got an interesting balladorium for you. Um. I'll let you tell it to the class, but I have to call my wife because the cleaning lady is telling me that the parking lot is full and she has to park oh. in front of my shul. So you can tell it to the class and I'll be back in a minute. It's just a 30-second volatorium. Uh, the volatorium was a commentary on the Torah who specialized in things like gematrias, and, uh, bro and which is uh, the number equivalents of letters and also the placement of different letters in different places in, in the verses. And if you, the rabbi's talking about these verses, uh, verse 10, uh, where it talks about six of their names were on one stone and six of their names were on the other stone. So if you, and he's talking about the connection between that and Shema, how Shema is looking at it from Hashem's perspective, from that, from up to down and Baruch Shem, the second verse of Shema is looking from this perspective of from uh, from us from down to up towards Hashem. So the Baal Turim says that the initial letters of these three words of the first three words of this of this verse of ten, it says Shisha Mishmosam Al, which means six of their names on. Those initial letters of those three words spell Shema. So I thought that was very interesting. He's also reminding me that uh, there were two uh, two um, Hasidim, two uh, followers of the Magid of Mezrich. Um, they were they were brothers. One was Rabbi Eli Melech of Lezensk, and his young and his uh, brother Rabbi Zushi of Anapoli. And uh, the the uh, they explained the Magid uh, asked. Oh, here comes the Rabbi again. Rabbi, can you hear me? Oh, Ra All Rabbi, right. yeah. So I was just mentioning that the, the first three words of verse 10, which is Shisha Mishmosam Al, spell Shema. Wow, that's good. That's, that's good. That's that's from the Baal Turin. Wow, that ties in very well with what we're saying. Yeah. And then I was just, well uh, yeah, I was just um, mentioning that the, you were talking about the two aspects from the aspect of Shema from above to below and the aspect of Baruch Shem from below to above. So it reminded me that there are two Hasidim 
uh, of the Magid of Mezrich, Rabbi Malach of Lezhensk and Rabbi Zusha of Anapoli. And yeah. one's approach was, how does a person relate to Hashem that the that Hashem is so great and how and that's where a person finds himself because of the greatness of Hashem. That was Rabbi Elian Melech. And Rabbi Zusha, his, his, his relationship with, with Hashem was just the opposite. How small is, is a person and that's how he relates to Hashem. So each one had their own path, and those two paths made up the two aspects of one path of the Magid that that, that approach to, uh, to... Hold on one second, please. Hold on one second, please. Okay, very good. Yes, yeah, so the so the, the Magid students had these two aspects of how to relate, how to serve Hashem. One was serving Hashem by the, by recognizing the greatness of Hashem. And one was recognizing serving Hashem by recognizing the smallness of a person. Nice, that nice. Was, that was the Rebelli Melch and Reb Zusha. Very good. Yashikoyach. Well done. Okay, everybody. Have a good okay. week. Bye. You will. Thank you. I think, I bye think bye. Moshe has a question. Yes. Rabbi, you know, I, was, I was just mentioning something. I'm thinking about something. When you said the October 7th uh, massacre, that that actually brought Achtu amongst the Jews. I mean, my my question is, is does there have to be a knife at the throat of people? And I mean, you have to, in order to bring Achtu amongst Jews, Korbanot? I mean, I, I don't know. Me, there shouldn't have to be ever something. again. There shouldn't have to be ever again. And I'm not saying that's the reason for it. Nobody understands these things. I'm just saying it happens to be a side, um, you know, something good that resulted from it, despite the terrible tragedy. Why did that have to happen? That's not really in my realm of understanding. But it so happens that it did bring about that Achtos, and hopefully with that Achtos, we can defeat our enemy. Amen. Okay, all the best, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.